This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The United States President George Bush arrived in the Jordanian capital Amman on an official visit aimed at ending violence in Iraq as well as discussing the Palestinian file. Bush, whose administration has been facing mounting pressure to specify a timetable for the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq, has met with King Abdullah II of Jordan. During a meeting with Iraq's Prime Minister Nour al-Maliki, Jordan's king said that he hopes that Iraqi factions will put aside their differences and that al-Maliki Bush summit will produce a new mechanism to help end the violence in Iraq. The lives of the Iraqi people depend on the Prime Minister al-Maliki's meeting with the United States President George W. Bush, who wants to send a message that he supports al-Maliki. According to a memo leaked just hours before Bush was to meet in Jordan with the embattled Iraqi leader, the U.S. National Security Advisor Steve Hadley had serious doubts that Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki can govern his country while it's being torn apart by sectarian violence. The memo, which was written after Hadley met with al-Maliki in Baghdad on October 30th, 2006 reveals that the Iraqi government and the U.S.-led coalition in Iraq have failed to control sectarian violence in the country. It also asks Washington to mount pressure on al-Maliki to reform his parliamentary bloc and send thousands more U.S. reserve troops to Iraq. While many Americans doubt that the Bush al-Maliki summit will produce a magical solution to the deteriorating crisis in Iraq, Jordanians hope that the meeting will lead to a positive outcome which will help end the violence before it spirals totally out of control. Meanwhile, the Sadr party has suspended its membership in the Iraqi government and parliament in a protest over the Bush al-Maliki meeting. Get out of the country, terrorist! Regardless of the outcome of the Bush al-Maliki summit, security and the promotion of democracy in the Middle East are still Bush's top priority. This news came despite other troubling issues such as the chaos in Iraq, the crisis in Lebanon, and the deadlock in peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians. قالت الكتلة الصدرية أنها علقت مشاركتها في حكومة رئيس الوزراء نور المالكي وفي البرلمان العراقي وقال المتحدث A spokesman from the Sadr movement of Shia clerk Muqtada Sadr in Iraq said that the movement has temporarily resigned from the Nur al-Maliki's government and the Iraqi parliament. The spokesman said that the decision was made to protest the meeting between al-Maliki and President Bush in Amman, saying that the meeting has aggravated the feelings of the Iraqi people. During a meeting with King Abdullah II of Jordan, the head of the Higher Council for the Islamic Republic, Revolution Abdul Aziz Al Hakim said that the biggest loser as a result of a civil war in Iraq will be the Sunni Arabs. Al Hakim added that the Iraqi people need the support of the Arab world and it is not in Arabs' interests to abandon Iraq. We are joined from Iraq by Saleh Al Mutlaq, the head of Iraqi Front for National Dialogue. Mr. Al Mutlaq, you have probably heard of Al Hakim's comments. What is your response? Sayyid Al Mutlaq. ربما بلغكم ما قاله الحكيم فما قولكم 
والله يا أخي العزيز إنه لأمر مؤسف ومحزن أن تصدر تصريحات من شخص يعتبر نفسه قائد سياسي في هذه. It is tragic and unfortunate that a person who considers himself a political leader makes such comments. The loser, as a result of a civil war in Iraq, is the whole country and its entire people, regardless of whether they are Sunnis, Shiites, Arabs, Kurds, Turkmen, Muslim, or Christian. Once again, if a civil war breaks out in Iraq, we all lose and no one will gain. It is our duty to oppose any ideology that may fuel a civil war. The comments issued by Abdel Al-Aziz Al-Hakim promote hate and sectarianism, which are the basic ingredients for a civil war. Why did Al-Hakim refer specifically to your group in his statement. Is it because you are taking part in the Amman summit? First of all, we are not a partner in these talks. We are a national front looking out for the interests of all the Iraqi people, including Sunnis and Shiites. Unfortunately, the groups that are now taking part in the Amman talks are the same ones that dragged Iraq to this point. Sectarian Sunni and Shiite groups are the ones issuing hateful comments because they want to create chaos and division among the Iraqi people. While they are sitting at the bargaining table, populated Iraqi cities and towns are being heinously and inhumanely bombarded. The statements issued by Abed al-Aziz Hakim reveal the nature of the current political process in Iraq and its failure to bring the country to where Iraqis want it to be. Talks in Jordan between Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki and U.S. President George Bush are expected to yield major advancements regarding the deteriorating situation in Iraq, where explosions occur every day. As anticipation grows at the political and public levels in Iraq about what will happen in the Amman talks, dozens of people throughout Iraq are being killed and wounded. In Samarra, six policemen were killed and four others were injured by a booby-trapped car that exploded near a police station. Then, armed assailants temporarily occupied the police station in Mosul the Iraqi police said that a suicide bomber exploded his booby trap car outside a police station, killing one civilian and injuring more than 20 others. The family was in front of the police station. The explosion went off from inside the police car. The entire family was lost. فيما عثرت الشرطة في مدينة الديوانية على جثة معلم عليها آثار أعيرة نارية the police in the city of Diwaniya found a body that showed signs of torture. Armed men had kidnapped the man earlier before killing him. Also, Iraqi and American forces carried out an attack operation in the city of Baquba, north of Baghdad, killing 13 armed assailants. Two policemen were killed and seven others were injured by a bomb explosion that targeted their patrol in the Nahabati area in central Baghdad. According to an Iraqi source, the Ministry of Health came under a mortar shell attack by armed assailants. No casualties were reported. The United States Army announced that one of its soldiers was killed by a bomb explosion in Salah al-Din province. Meanwhile, the judge presiding over the special court, which is trying former Iraqi President Saddam Hussein in an Anfal case, ejected from the courtroom Farhan Mutlaq Najbouri's defense lawyer and ordered him to be detained for 24 hours for violating professional conduct. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, I will be leaving the courtroom. Allow me to speak. I want to finish stating my opinion. 
المحامي بديع عارف عزت من قاعة المحكمة السنادن لنص The court has decided to eject attorney Badi Araf Azet from the courtroom for violating professional conduct. Get out! Get out! The court has decided to take legal measures and detain Badi Araf Azet for a period of 24 hours. In New York, the United Nations General Secretary Kofi Annan called for organizing an international peace conference on Iraq that brings together all Iraqi groups and that is planned with the assistance of the United Nations. He reiterated the need for having all sides attend the conference. Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council extended the mandate of the multinational forces led by the United States and Iraq until December 2007. Tehran and Baghdad on Wednesday emphasized the need for withdrawal of the occupying forces from Iraq. That came at a joint press conference of Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and his Iraqi counterpart Jalal Talabani in Tehran, where President Ahmadinejad noted that the alien forces deployed in Iraq should allow the Iraqi government to take control of state affairs if they really support the Iraqi people. President Ahmadinejad then termed the those that harbor terrorism as the most prolific enemies of the Iraqi nation, adding the very presence of the occupation force is a constant source of insecurity in the region. Iraqi president in turn said his Tehran visit has been fruitful, adding senior officials from the two countries have reached full agreement in all areas. Following the press conference, the two presidents signed two memoranda of understanding to boost cooperation in the areas of culture, education and industry. Meanwhile, the Iraqi president left Tehran for Baghdad hours ago and was officially seen off by his Iranian counterpart, Mohammad Ahmadinejad. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in a letter to the American people on Wednesday accused their government of coercion, force and injustice and urged the United States to pull out of Iraq. Ahmadinejad's five-page letter also called on Washington to recognize a Palestinian state. In his letter, the Iranian president said, governments are there to serve their own people. No people wants to side with or support any oppressors. But regrettably, the U.S. administration disregards even its own public opinion and remains in the forefront of supporting the trampling of the rights of the Palestinian people. On Iraq, President Ahmadinejad said that with a, co with a constitution and government now in place, would it not be more beneficial to bring the U.S. officers and soldiers home and to spend the astronomical U.S. military expenditures in Iraq for the welfare and prosperity of the American people? As we reported, Egyptian intelligence chief Omar Suleiman arrived in the country this morning. Suleiman met with Defense Minister Amir Peretz in Tel Aviv to discuss the latest developments in negotiations over a potential prisoner swap, including kidnapped IDF Corporal Gilad Shalit. Suleiman, who has been spearheading mediation efforts between Israel and the Palestinians, briefed Peretz on his talks last week with Syrian-based Hamas political leader Khaled Mashal. According to the intelligence chief, progress has been made. However, it appears the number of prisoners to be freed remains a major sticking point. Suleiman expressed optimism that a deal could be finalized within several weeks. The Egyptian official later traveled to Jerusalem, where he is meeting with Prime Minister Ehud Almert. The two are also set to discuss ways to shore up the ceasefire and to prevent continued smuggling of weapons from Egypt into Gaza. Prime Minister Ehud Almert says he is frustrated by the fact that Palestinian terrorists in Gaza continue firing Qassam rockets into Israel despite the ceasefire. Speaking after a meeting with the European ambassador to Israel, Almert said the EU should take note that Israel is showing restraint 
while the Palestinians continue with violent activities. Meeting at the Finnish embassy in Tel Aviv, Ambassador Ramiro Sibrian reported to Almert on the just-completed meeting between Arab and European foreign ministers where they discussed prospects for Middle East peace. The uh, ceasefire which was announced on uh, Saturday night, I must admit that we are a little bit frustrated by the uh, uh, continued shooting of Qassam rockets in uh, the south uh, by the Palestinians. I uh, hope very much that the Palestinians will honor their commitments and will stop completely all the uh, violent uh, activities and the uh, some rockets shooting against Israel. And I'm sure that the uh, uh, European Union and all the members uh, will uh, register the fact that uh, Israel shows and will continue to show restraint, but that at the same time, Palestinians must abide by their commitments so that the ceasefire will effectively take place. Security is tight in Jordan as U.S. President George Bush is set to arrive in Amman shortly for talks with Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. Jordan's King Abdallah is hosting the summit. Arab leaders are growing increasingly concerned over the bloodshed in Iraq and the potential spillover effect in the region. Several hundred Jordanians gathered outside the parliament building to protest the Bush visit. U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who is accompanying Bush, said Syria and Iran need to do more toward reducing the level of violence in Iraq. If the Syrians and the Iranians can at any time follow policies that help in the stability of, of Iraq. They don't need us, the United States, to tell them what will help stabilize Iraq. But let's not, uh, let's, let's not fool ourselves. Let's not uh, hear... Uh, recognize that, uh, not recognize that Iran and Syria are quite capable of engaging in policies that will help stabilize uh, Iraq if that's what they choose to do. The Bush al Maliki summit in Jordan will likely deal with more than the war in Iraq. The Israeli Palestinian conflict could also be on the agenda. That's the view of former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Zaman Shuval. He spoke earlier to IBS Yochanan al Ram. Mr. Ambassador, as you mentioned, the uh, Baker Commission has wrapped up its uh, Iraq study and will uh, turn in their report next month. Some have suggested that James Baker uh, may actually suggest to Bush that he speak directly with Syria and Iran about the problem in Iraq. Is that a good idea? Aren't they responsible for the problems in Iraq? Well, I certainly think it's a bad idea and so do many others. I mean, the Iranians are certainly responsible for much of the uh, violence going on in Iraq right now, and the Syrians are also very, I would say, uh, responsible from the other side, from the Sunni side. But I think uh, President Bush already yesterday gave a very clear answer to that. He said he's not going to talk to the Iranians unless they stop their nuclear program. So. If one believes that the Iranians are actually going to stop the nuclear program, that's another thing. I'm afraid that that's not going to happen right now. The Egyptian head of intelligence, Omar Suleiman, heads towards Israel to carry out talks with Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Omer regarding the details of the prisoner exchange deal that is being formulated between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. The deal was mediated by Egypt. It is said that the Palestinian prisoner Marwan al barghouti played a role that will secure the release of the Israeli prisoner Gilad Shalit, who was being held by Palestinian factions, in return for Israel releasing Palestinian prisoners. But which prisoners? How many of them? Will the exchange be simultaneous or phased? This is being hotly debated between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um Hatim is a Palestinian from Hebron. In 2001, the Israelis arrested her son, Hatem Jamil, for belonging to the Quds Brigade. Since then, she has been patiently waiting for him to be released and returned to his family. She was very hopeful that this would happen in 2004, when Israel released 100 prisoners as a goodwill gesture towards President Mahmoud Abbas. However, Hatem was not among those prisoners who were released. Today, Hatem's 
mother and many other relatives of Palestinian prisoners have renewed hope that their imprisoned family members will be freed since Israel appears for the first time to be preparing an exchange of Palestinian prisoners for the Israeli prisoner, soldier Gilad Shalit. Israel, after it failed to rescue Shalit through incursions, bombings and assassinations, now has accepted the prisoner exchange deal. The Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in the Knesset was ordered to put together the details of the deal. We are, ready for the re we are ready for the release of the kidnapped soldier Gilad Shalit in exchange for the release of hundreds in jail. I think it is important to do this because it's very important that Gilad Shalit returns to us. On Monday, the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Omer described the attempt to exchange Shalit for Palestinian prisoners as a concession by Israel. However, the Palestinian Prime Minister Ishmael Haniya said that this is not an act of charity but the reclaiming of one of many legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. We are not talking about painful concessions. The Palestinian people have a right to the creation of an independent Palestinian state within the 1967 borders, with Jerusalem as its capital and the right of return for refugees. Although the details of the exchange have not been revealed, it is expected that the deal will include four phases. The deal was mediated by Egypt. Marwan al -Baghut General Secretary of the Fatah Movement, who is currently imprisoned in an Israeli jail, played a role in reaching the deal. According to what Ehud Olmert promised, the deal is expected to include the release of jailed women in Israeli prisons, the youth, and men, including those who have been sentenced to long prison terms. As Olmert makes the offer to release 1,000 Palestinian prisoners on the condition that the Israeli soldier Shalit is released first, the Hamas government Firms that the deal will include what was agreed upon with Egypt. This includes the agreement that Khaled Mashal made in Cairo last week, which will require thousands of Palestinian prisoners to be released before Shalit is returned to his family. He must accept the deal, as it was understood by the Egyptian side, so that Palestinian prisoners will be released simultaneously in exchange for the release of Gilad Shalit. Despite this, there was optimism by both the Palestinian and Israeli sides that a deal will be reached because it is in both nations' best interest to come to an agreement. Palestinians want this to mark the beginning of a political horizon that will resolve other issues. لن يكون أمام البابا بنديكتوس السادس عشر فرصة ركوب السيارة البابوية في تركيا Pope Benedict XVI began his landmark visit to Turkey on Tuesday amidst massive protests that attracted more than 20,000 Muslims. Amidst strict security measures, the Pope did not get to ride in his white papal car like he did during his visit to Germany. Instead, he rode in a bulletproof black vehicle with tinted windows which was heavily guarded. The original goal of the Pope's visit to Turkey was to meet leaders of the Orthodox Church in Ankara. Today, the Pope is carrying a message of dialogue, reconciliation and brotherhood between Muslims and Christians. In a last-minute change of plan, Turkey's Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan greeted the Pope as he stepped off the plane, saying that the pontiff's visit is very important because it contributes to world peace. الإسلاميون القوميون حاولوا تحريك أنصارهم للاعتراض على الزيارة Meanwhile, Islamic nationalists organized massive protests to condemn the Pope's visit in light of his earlier criticism of Islam. During a speech he gave back in September, the Pope cited a 14th century Byzantine emperor linking Islam to violence. The pontiff today eased his objections to Turkey joining the European Union, which he'd called a grave error before being chosen Pope in April of last year. According to Turkey's Prime Minister, the pontiff supports Ankara's bid for membership in the EU. The Pope is carrying a message of peace and reconciliation, saying that this noble land has seen the blossoming of the Islamic civilization in the most diverse areas, including literature and art. During his visit to Turkey, a predominantly 
Muslim nation, the great pontiff is trying to mend the bridge between Muslims and Christians in the aftermath of his remarks about Islam last September. Like his predecessor, John Paul II, Benedict will visit Istanbul's Blue Mosque and the Hagia Sophia Museum, which for more than 1,000 years was the largest Christian cathedral that was converted to a mosque and later turned into a museum. Benedict did not cancel today's trip as he was advised by Ali Aga, a Turkish citizen who tried to kill Pope John Paul II during a visit to Turkey. In Ankara, Pope Benedict XVI met with the head of the Turkish religious affairs in the government, Ali Berdak Aglu, after meeting with the Turkish Prime Minister, Rajab Tayyip Erdogan. The Pope's meeting coincided with public demonstrations that were held in most Turkish cities, protesting his statements defaming Islam, which the Pope made earlier. During the meeting, Aglu said that the religion of Islam has never for a day been a religion of violence. He explained that such a statements form an incentive to exploit religion wrongfully. Security measures taken to protect the Pope are greater than those taken before the visit of the U.S. President, George W. Bush, to Turkey. These were the words of Turkish Foreign Minister Abdullah Gul, which were confirmed by Ismail Shalishkan, the spokesman for Ankara's security administration. The two officials also called on residents of the capital to be patient with the closing of main streets in the hopes that protesters would not misbehave. They were referring to members of the Waqf al Iran, which belongs to the National Unity Party, who threatened violent protests during the Pope's visit to Turkey. The leader of the party, Mohsin Hayuglu, rejected the message of friendship that the Pope sent to the people of Turkey before he came. He called for the Pope to offer a clear apology to Muslims for defaming the Prophet, peace be upon him. Yashar al Yukan, the leader of the Freedom and Change Party, demanded that the security forces prevent the Pope from praying in Ayat Sophia, just as they had prevented young Muslims. Muslim worshippers. The Pope must not be allowed to perform any religious acts in Ayat Sophia, such as prayers or showing his cross. If this happens, then the government must be politically responsible. The police should use gas against him as it did against the worshippers. For democratic reasons, the security forces allowed the guilds of the public sector to hold symbolic protests and send out press releases in the Kazale district in the capital, Ankara. The protesters chanted slogans protesting the Pope's visit. Opposition leaders said that the visit is an attempt to ignite division among the religions. We do not accept the Pope's visit before he makes a global apology to Muslims. He is trying to ignite divisions between the Christian and the Muslim world. Though the government only allowed guilds, foundations, civic and social organizations and political parties to hold symbolic protests during the Pope's visit to Ankara, these protests reflect the exact sentiment of the Turkish people. Though most Turkish political forces agreed on the need for the Pope to apologize to Muslims, they only deferred on the mechanism and the time for such an apology. Ankara has not witnessed such a heightening in security during any visit by any foreign guests. This shows that the Turkish public seriously rejects the Pope's visit because of his statements defaming Islam. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous Mosaic programs obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly Mosaic Intelligence Report. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax-deductible contribution to Link TV either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen.
This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.